Everyone I've ever met wants to be successful, right? I've never met someone who will say out loud, now they may sabotage themselves, but they won't say out loud, boy, I really want to be a failure. We all, whether we're in school, at work, wherever we are, want to be a success. Well, someone sent me this this week. It's from Dr. Lawrence R. Samuel. He's a psychologist. And he says there are basically, in his opinion, seven keys to success. Seven keys to success. The first one is this. Reject the model of money, power, and fame. That's not bad. And you may not get slapped in the face. Number two. Some of y'all will catch that later. Number two. Thank you. Avoid comparisons to others. Number three, take a holistic view of yourself. Don't just look at one area. Look at the big picture. Number four, celebrate your victories no matter how small. I like that. Number five, accept failures. Number six, Prioritize relationships. And number seven, leave something behind. That's not a bad list. Seven things that this particular counselor feels like leads to a successful life. But I want to talk about number five. Highlight number five, accept failures. That's one of the toughest things to do on this list. Because what happens to us in life, if you live long enough, most of us, not all of us, but most of us will fail. I'm kidding. All of us will fail. We'll fail. And it's easy when you fail, follow this, to feel like a failure. And it's easy when you fail, when you mess up, when you fall, to dwell on that failure, to dwell on that incident, to dwell on that season, and that prevents you from enjoying the present and having a better future. A friend of mine said this. I like the way he framed it. He said, in order to have a better future, you must quit trying to have a better past. That's good, isn't it? I wish I was smart enough to invent that saying. In order to have a better future, you must quit trying to have a better past. So how do we do that? How do we, as men and women, as young people who want to be successful, who want to have a better future, how do we do that? Well, it's all there for us. In this chapter we've been looking at the last several weeks, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Romans chapter eight. And there's one word, I believe, that is not mentioned in the seven keys to so-called success. There's one word, one word, that will be so incredibly helpful and vital for us to understanding and living out what success means in the eyes of God. Check it out, Romans 8, 28 through 30. We know, we know all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. We looked at that verse last week. Why is that? Because those whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those whom he predestined he also called and those who he called he justified and those who he justified he also glorified <sighs> right when you, when you read that passage there my 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 phrase would be everybody calm down because there's a lot of big weighty theological words in those few verses But as we look at those words, and I want to define those words in just a few seconds and and kind of clear through the theological weeds, if you would, we're going to get to that one word, I believe, that sums up success. I believe 
that will lead all of us here really to a better future. But let's look at these words that Paul is laying out here that can be so confusing and for some people have been controversial that I don't think they need to be. First word is the word for no. It's that God foreknew us. And what that word really means, it means to be foreloved. It means that God has an intimate knowledge of you and of me. He foreloved us. He foreknew us. And then the big P word, he predestined us. And the word predestination basically means to decide beforehand. So if you have decided for God in Christ, the reason you decided and the reason I decided is because God had already decided in eternity past, okay? So it means to decide beforehand. Then the word called, I love the word called. The word called means to be named, to be named. And it's interesting to me uh, doing uh, and being a part of a church for many, many years and talking to people about God, about the gospel, people who are far away from God, people who may consider themselves atheists and agnostics and skeptics, people who are kind of seeking in between. And when I talk to them about the gospel, Sometimes it just bounces off, boom, 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 boom. For months, it bounces off, boom. For years, it may bounce off, boom. But all of a sudden, the light comes on. They're like, wow, I never really understood who God was and what God has done for me and the invitation that God's given to me. And they feel called. It's like God calls their name out specifically. So there's a general call, hey, Everybody come, everybody be a part. And all of a sudden, Joe, you come. Mike, you come. Mary, you come. Christy, you come. And it's like God calls you by name. A lot of us know what that's like. I don't mean you hear some voice from heaven, but there's something inside of you that feels a personal call from God. So God calls us personally, he calls us individually. Another word here, another fancy word, theological word, is the word justified. The word justified. To be justified means to be forgiven and declared righteous. We looked at that in our first week in the goat in Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. How can you and I stand before God right now or for eternity with no condemnation? How can we do that? I can't. Not on my own two feet, not on my own merits, not on my record. I am a failure. I have lost. I am a sinner. I broke God's law. But God sent Christ to, die, to live in my place, to die in my place, to rise again. So when I come to Christ, I am justified. I am forgiven. And I'm also declared righteous by Christ's righteousness. I have an F plus on my moral report card. Jesus has an A plus. God gives me Jesus' A plus on my morality, on my righteousness, though I don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace, amazing grace. So I'm justified. Also, I'm glorified. What does that mean? That means that one day, by God's grace, because I'm justified, I will be glorified. I will be with God in heaven, or in the new heavens and the new earth, and live with him forever and ever and ever. Okay? I'll have a new life. I'll have a new body. I will live in a different reality that I'm living in now. He foreknew us. He predestined us. He called us. He justified us. And he will glorify us. I mean, if we had time, this is some heavy-duty stuff, Right? I mean, he's trying to talk about uh, what God was up to when there was no sense of time and space, what God has done for us in time and space, and what God will do for us outside of time and space. So philosophically, scientifically, if you're into quantum physics, there's a lot going on here that we don't have time to get into, but this is a beautiful and powerful passage. So what's the one word? The, the one word that, that I believe sums up 
these few verses with all of its theological depth, okay? Sums it all up. Here's the word. Tenacious. That's the word. Let's say that again together. Tenacious. Let's say that again with some tenacity. Rather, tenacious. Again, tenacious. Tenacious is a powerful and a very critical, important word. And if we're going to be successful in anything that we do in life, especially with God, but also in our career and our family and other endeavors and our friendships and relationships, we have to learn how to be, let's say it together, tenacious, tenacious. Now, I don't do this a lot, but I'm gonna do this today because if you look up the word tenacious, I like every single definition there. You know, they have the first definition, the second definition, the third definition. They're all good. Listen, the first one is tenacious is tending to keep a firm hold of something, clinging or adhering closely, not readily relinquishing a position. Tenacious. Persisting in existence, not easily dispelled, courage, metal, spirit, resolution, grit, the ability to resist opposition and danger and hardship. What are we seeing right now when we flip on CNN and Fox? We're seeing a Ukrainian people being very tenacious, persistent determination. It is considered a good character trait because a tenacious character will make its goal despite difficulties and barriers along the way. So this passage, and as we're gonna look at the rest of these verses at the end of the goat, Romans 8 is great, the greatest of all time. This passage from verse 28 all the way to 39 is about not our tenacity and God's call on our life to be tenacious. No, no, no. This is about God's tenacious love for you. God's tenacious, nonstop, powerful love, agape love for you. Check it out. God says, first of all, in his tenacious love, that you are known by him. You are foreknown by God. God had you. He had your life. He knows your heart. He knows your personality. He knows the struggles you have. God knows you. Do you ever feel like, I wish someone really, really know me, knew me? God knows you. God knows you. I want to be known. You are known. You are known. I can rest in God's knowledge for me. Perhaps you need to do this this week. Maybe you need to cut and paste on your laptop or your phone this passage in Psalm 139, verse 1 through 6, and just read it over and over again. Check it out. You have, heard, you have searched me, Lord. Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. By the way, this, this is David writing this passage. It's not some little mamsy-pamsy, Mr. Rogers kind of person. No, this is David. He is a warrior. He says, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. God has his eye on you. He knows that you're sitting here uh, in church right now. He watches you in the car. He watches you speeding down the freeway. 
sitting in traffic. He knows when you're getting up, when you're lying down, how many cups of coffee you've had. Obviously, I've had too many today. He knows everything about you. God knows you. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hit me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. He goes on to say in this chapter, if I would count the thoughts that God has for me, they would outnumber the grains of sand on planet Earth. God knows you. He has an intimate knowledge of all of your ways. It's a reflection of his tenacious love for you. He foreknew you. He foreloved you. Also, we see here in this passage, the tenacious love of God is that God pursued you. Pursued you. Some people get hung up with the whole predestination free will thing. I'm not gonna go there today. But to me, what God's predestinating love means is that God chose you. He chose you. He chose you. It's like when you go to a wedding and you hear the pastor, you know, talking to the bride and the groom. And he turns to, you know, the bride and said, out of all the women in the world, Joe chose you. Out of all the men in the world, Mary chose you. It's something, isn't it? It's a big deal to be chosen. So God has chosen us. God pursues us. Have you, have you noticed that, that God pursues you? God pursues you. Why? Because God is tenacious. You ever tried to run from God? Hey, I'm just going to run from God. I'm going to hide from God. I'm going to do my own thing, right? You ever try to do that? My hand's raised. I have. You know, I figured out, and I apologize, I'm a little slow. God's a whole lot faster than me. I can't outrun God. I can't outrun God. God pursues me. God pursues us. God pursues you because you're his child. You're his son and his daughter. If you pursue, if you're a parent, you pursue your own children, how much more will God pursue you? God pursues us. God is tenacious. So how do we see God's tenacious love? We know that we are known by God. You're known by him. We know that you're pursued by him. And also we can see in this passage you're transformed by him. God foreknew you, he predestined you, he called you by name, why? To conform you or transform you to the image of his son. He wants to make us broken, fallen creatures that we are, imperfect people that we are. He wants to make us and mold us and transform us into the image of his son. All things work together. God is using all things. All things that happen in our life are not good. All things that happen in our life, um, you know, are, are tough, uh, are difficult, but God is using all things when we cooperate him to transform us, to change us into the image of of his son. That's awesome. He does that by his spirit. He does that by his word. He does that through you and me and the community that we call the church. So God doesn't just call us, hey, be a part of my family. Hey, I've forgiven you. I've declared you righteous. I've given you an A plus on your moral report card when you really have an F. He doesn't do that just willy nilly. 
He justifies us so we can be brought into his family so he can begin that process of transforming us day by day by day by day by day. And he doesn't let go. As we were singing about earlier, God doesn't let go. God is tenacious. God is goal-oriented. God has a goal. God has a plan for your life. And God has not forgotten his plan for your life. And God's still in the business of transforming you into the image of his son. This is God's tenacious love for you. To be successful in God's eyes, I've got to understand, receive, and live out of his tenacious love for me. I have two daughters. They're old now, in the 20s. But when my oldest daughter was, I guess she was about 16 months old, she would love to go and climb back inside this baby treadmill that we got for her when she was simply, I don't know, six months. So she's 16 months, and she liked to climb around, and she would climb back in this treadmill and play a, bit, a little bit, and then she would get hung up. And she'd go, ah, or something like that, and I would go and get Nicole, that's her name, out of the baby treadmill, you know? Another hour passed, I'd be playing. What do you think had to happen? She'd climb back in the baby treadmill playing and then get hung up, you know, cry out. I would go and help her get untangled. The next day, she finally learned how not to get, no, of course not. She didn't learn that. She gets in the baby treadmill. Again, it's for a six-month-old. She's 16. She gets tangled up again. I'm upstairs studying or something. She cries out. I come down and get her out of the treadmill. Why? Because she's my daughter. Because I have a tenacious love for her. And when she gets tangled, I want to come in and the best I can help her to get untangled and eventually show her not how to get tangled again but I'm not going to stop helping her get out of the mess. I'm not going to stop trying to get her untangled because I am her dad. God is Abba Father. And when you are tangled or you're in a mess or you feel you're not progressing in the success that God has for you, God is not finished with you yet. He's not finished he has a tenacious love for you. He has a tenacious plan for your life, and we have to be open and yield to his plan. But he is a father, and he is a God who will never, ever let go of us. And this is just the beginning of God's tenacious love for you. More next week. Pray with me. Father, I thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. God, I thank you that you are a good God. You're a powerful God. You're, you're a God who calls us to experience your tenacious love firsthand up close and personal. God, I know that when we gather in a place here this morning, I know there's some people here who have never really stepped out and received your tenacious love personally. Perhaps they grew up in a church or something like this and they had a little bit of religion, but they never really, really said yes to you in a personal way. God, may today be that day I ask you would lead them, God, as only you can to stand and to come and to walk down these aisles and to receive everything 
that you desire for their life. God, may they do that in just a few moments. Lord, I also know that when we gather in this place on Sunday morning, there are many people here, men and women and young people, who are Christians, who are Christ followers, who have received and they're living out your tenacious love in their own life. And they're simply looking for a place where they can belong, a place where they can serve and grow. And you're leading them to join second today. God, may you lead those who need to stand and come and make their way down front and be a part of this community. Father, this is your invitation. This is your time. Lead those who need to stand and respond today. In Jesus' name.